various places as well as email it to everyone that registered. Um, they'll get priority uh, of the recording. So thank you. Uh, and that's what I'll start with is just thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and taking the time. Um, and thank you to Dr. Gonzalez and Cedar Sinai for instigating this. Um, the, we'll, go, we'll go through just a couple of things, what to expect. Uh, I'll do a couple of quick introductions, let you know a little bit about, about myself um, and the World Moya Moya Alliance, as well as um, all of the, the highlights and accolades of Dr. Gonzalez. He'll start out with um, a brief overview of Moya Moya, um, answering one or two questions that he knows he gets often. And then we'll go into the questions that were submitted um, online uh, as people registered, which are a nice variety and from a lot of folks. So again, thank you to everyone that did submit those questions. We appreciate it. Uh, a lot of things that were even questions I would have too as a patient. So, um, so again, for those that don't know me, I'm Jennifer Carlin Riley. I have Moya Moya. I was diagnosed in 2008 after some light, moderate symptoms of numbness and tingling, some headaches. Um, I made my way to UCLA and my first angiogram test results were so bad that they checked me into the hospital then and there immediately. Uh, and by 6 a.m. the next morning, I was meeting Dr. Gonzalez for the first time as we prepared for my first of two surgeries. I had the EDAS surgery and a burr hole on each side. The surgeries went very well. There were a couple complications after I got discharged. Um, so that brought up my second surgery just three weeks later, but everything went fairly well. Um, I've had a few bumps, I think as all of us do, but um, nothing too terribly horrible. And by uh, 2015, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure that was my first um, time doing and organizing a Moya Moya event. Um, also uh, with the assistance of Dr. Gonzalez uh, and some other folks again at UCLA at the time. Uh, and that really has led me on my journey and path and honor to try and do Moya Moya advocacy work. Um, that led me to um, doing the, um, our becoming one of the founding members of the World Moya Moya Alliance. Um, that was in May of 2021 that we got our official uh, 501c3 nonprofit license, but I will say it's been many years in the making. Um, even in 2015, I was already in touch with uh, Tara McGinnis, who's been a big advocate in the community. A lot of people know her name. And DJ Johnson, who was the first patient to um, create a website solely for Moya Moya information. And between a couple other patients, as well as parents of pediatric patients, we founded the WMA. And a brief little summary of our mission statement and our goals are to educate the population at large about Moya Moya disease, collaborate with specialists, fund research both nationally and internationally, and do what we can to help improve the lives of everyone with Moya Moya and touched by Moya Moya. Um, so we're very excited for this of our first of hopefully many collaborations and um, events that are here to help us support the Moya Moya community. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, formally Dr. Gonzalez. Um, again, not only was, was he my neurosurgeon, um, luckily, but now he is at Cedar sinai uh, He is a professor of neurosurgery, vascular and endovascular neurosurgery, director of the neurosurgery neurovascular laboratory, and um, this is all at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Uh, correct me if I miss anything, doctor. Um, but I will just say personally, above and beyond all his titles and uh, accolades and many of the letters behind his name, he is a wonderful, wonderful human. And I've had the pleasure of knowing um, for the last, uh, goodness, 16 years almost. <laughs> uh, so why don't you go ahead and uh, get us going, doctor? Well, thank you, Jen, for that kind introduction. I. I, besides my work at Cedar sinai as a professor of neurosurgery, I'm also very closely linked with the American Heart Association. I'm the chair of the Neurointerventional Committee, and that is one of the subcommittees of the Stroke Council of the American Heart Association. And uh, as part of that, one of the things that we, a uh, couple of years ago, identified as a gap in knowledge, meaning something that doctors really don't think much about it. We identify Moya Moya and put together a scientific statement that was public a couple of years ago that I have also the honor to chair. 
And uh, b before we get into the matter of the subject, uh, Jen says something that is very beautiful, that is how Moya Moya, even though we are facing an easy difficulty and we are going to dive into that, also somehow has put us together, and that is a great honor. I, I studied medicine in Colombia, and I came to UCLA to do my fellowship in interventional radiology before I even did my neurosurgery residency. And I have to tell you that I had never heard of Moya Moya. Uh, in the School of Medicine, the only reference, remote reference in my memory was something with puffs of smoke. But when I came to work at UCLA, I started seeing the impact that that disease had in the people here in Los Angeles. And it became uh, really a passion of mine to try to understand it. I have been touched by Moya Moya because I believe that it's a tremendously interesting disease, but also because I have had the opportunity to intervene in the lives of wonderful individuals. And I have learned a lot from the books, from what I have read, from the, my relationships with people who work in Moya Moya, but mainly from my patients. And uh, it, it is great that I have this opportunity today to talk with all of you and hopefully answer some of the questions that you may have to the extension of what we can. One of the common themes that we will see today is that we need to work more on this. And, and on a scientific perspective, that's why this is fascinating. But on a practical perspective, that is why this is necessary. We need to work together because we're not too many. Not too many people know about Moya Moya. Not too many people suffer Moya Moya disease. So unless we do a coordinated effort, uh, this is always going to be kind of a second-ranked disease that is not going to be addressed properly. And there are very good reasons to not to let that happen. One of those is all of you. Another one is my perspective from the scientific point of view. It's a fascinating condition. So hopefully we can dive into some of those things today. So thank you for having me, Jen. <laughs> of course. Again, thank you um, for the opportunity. So we'll go into some of the questions that were submitted. Um, I try to categorize them a little, but um, just from general info and statistics point of view, um, our very own Sarah Park from LA has submitted this uh, question. Doctor, what are the latest stats on how common Moya Moya is? For example, do we know now one and X amount of people have Moya Moya? And secondarily, are there new interventions to diagnose and or treat Moya Moya? Yes, so that's that's a very good, important point, and, and let me do a clarification that is essential. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with the distinction between Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya syndrome, and even Moya Moya angiopathy. And that becomes a very important point of distinction between all these family of conditions. If I would have to put it together, I would say that this Moya Moya group of diseases all of them are characterized by producing this reduction in the size of the arteries of the brain. That is the common thing that all of them have. The main difference is that in some cases, we get to know possible risk factors that are maybe inducing that narrowing. When we get to know another condition that may be associated and producing that narrowing, we call that Moya Moya syndrome. And some of those conditions include, uh, depending of where you are, this is like intracranial lateral sclerosis. And I will clarify that where you are in a moment. Uh, but other conditions, having problems in the thyroid, having lupus, having received surgery or having been radiated for brain tumors, having brain tumors can induce these kind of forms of moya moya. And uh, or inflammatory processes, having sequela of an inflammation of a meningitis or an infection. In those cases in which we can identify a possible reason to have the narrowing of the arteries of the brain, we call that Moya Moya syndrome because the pathology is different. If you imagine if you have risk factors that can produce that disease, then we can address some of those risk factors. Now, I say depending on where you are, because there is important regional differences. People who live in Japan and Korea have a special form. People who live in China have a different form. And here in the United States, in Europe, and in Latin America, there are different forms of Moya Moya. The Moya Moya disease itself is that condition in which there is no other risk factor. We don't find any autoimmune disorder, past history of radiation, past history of inflammations, nothing that explains why the arteries are becoming narrow. 
that distinction is important because it has been made very murky, the research and the understanding of what is the real frequency and presence of Moya Moya disease. And to answer now directly the question of Sarah, we really don't know exactly. We have some data of how many patients have Moya Moya uh, disease or syndrome. So that's the first point. We don't know in the United States exactly how many of the patients that are diagnosed as Moya Moya have a form of <laughs> secondary disease, meaning another reason to have the, the narrowing of the arteries, and how many of them have the primary form, that one in which we don't have any other etiology as a possible cause for the disease. But the base data that we have is from registries of hospitals. And that data is important because it shows that every year, at least approximately six patients of six of out a million people gets to be newly diagnosed with Moya Moya. Six of a million, that is really a very low number. Now in Japan, where we have a little bit better data, we know that that number may be as high as nine in a million. So we know that there are some factors that make the things different. But in the United States, the best data that we have of how new patients get to be diagnosed every year is around six in every million. Now, how many people live with Moya Moya, that is what we call prevalence? That one we don't know for sure. We know that in Japan is around 30 of every million people. But in the United States, the best data that we have is based on how many people get hospitalized per year with Moya Moya. And we think that it's around 10 of every million. So the, the short answer is that it's rare. It's not too many people. Few people suffer this condition. Now, this has some two important implications. When we look at the data that has been collected in the United States before the 90s, it was not recognized and the numbers seem to be lower. And when we look at how it has progressed over time, it seems that it has increased in the number of patients that suffer Moya Moya. Rather than an increase, probably I think there is more awareness of the existence of the disease, and then people is diagnosing it more. But we still need to do more work on it. We, we need to differentiate the two types, and we need to see what is the real number. We believe for now that that number, six of a million, is the number that we get of new cases per year of Moya Moya disease. We know also that affects more women than men. We know also that, interestingly, over the years, seem that men are being diagnosed more and more. But it also, it may be because of the preconception before that they didn't have Moya Moya, and now we are accepting that they may have the disease. I hope that that answers the question, sir. And there was yeah, a follow-up question to that. Uh, new methods of diagnostic, I believe, yeah, Jen? In the way of diagnostics or even treatment that are that are maybe new that we might not know of. Yes. So um, let, let me go back to the disease itself, and that will make it easy to understand the options of treatment that there is and the future options of treatment that may be in the in, in the prospect uh, of how to treat Moya Moya. In Moya Moya, there are two components. One component is the narrowing of the arteries, and the other component is the growth of vessels. In some cases, that growth of vessels is just a response of the body to try to bring blood because there is not enough going through the narrowing. And because of the narrowing of the arteries of the brain, there is insufficient blood perfusion, and then that's how patients may get ischemia or insufficient amount of blood to the brain. But there is also the risk that some of those vessels that form around to try to bring blood to the brain, uh, because they form under the stress situation of being uh, hypoperfused, they tend to form in a dysplastic way. What that means is that those collaterals are not normal. They are big vessels that sometimes may form little bubbles or aneurysms and may produce bleedings. And that's why patients with Moya Moya may have both ischemia or bleedings. Now, the treatments for this condition, we could conceive them in two parts. Treatments that would be directed to the disease itself, to how to control the disease and either correct it or control it, and treatments that are directed to resolve the problem. So let me start first with those. The treatments that we have to resolve the problem are mainly surgical, and those have been very successful in general. 
So once somebody has not insufficient blood going to the brain, several studies have shown that the best thing that we can do is try to bring more blood to the brain. And the way to bring more blood to the brain is by doing the surgical bypasses, both the direct or indirect or the combined bypasses. Because by doing that, then we kind of are, are uh, passing and overpassing the issue of the narrowing, providing another source of blood flow to the brain in such a way that the pressing problem of not having insufficient blood can be addressed. And how to enhance that and the different competing techniques, it's not very clear that one is better than the other one. Everybody has kind of different approaches and maybe we can discuss that later. But let me go probably to what is the essence of the question. Is there any new treatment or anything to, to better diagnose or treat moya moya? And on that one, we really don't have any significant therapeutic advances. There is no pharmacological agents that have promising things that we think may be in the future an alternative for the treatment of moya moya. And part of that is related to the fact that this is a rare disease, then the pharmaceutical companies usually don't have a lot of interest in doing research for things that will be rare. Uh, part of that problem also comes because of the very complex disease itself. So here, that differentiation between those patients that we know have secondary, uh, primary reasons to have secondary moya moya become very important. If somebody has high cholesterol, high blood pressure, or diabetes, or other conditions that can produce the vessels to be narrow, then treating those uh, aspects of the disease become very important. So the use of the statins, antihypertensives, all those things become very, very useful. If somebody has lupus or thyroid disease or has been exposed to radiation, kind of all those the little things may determine different pathways of treatment. In the case of primary moya moya or moya moya disease, it's more difficult. Because we know that there are genetic components, but there are other factors that we still don't understand. We have been able to identify some of the genes that produce the disease, but we still don't know how that gene and what else is required to produce the narrowing in the vessels and to have different behaviors because not everybody gets the same form of disease. In some cases, it's more progressive. In some others, it's not as progressive. In some of them present with bleedings. In some of them affects only one side. So we still don't have good targets for the treatment. One could think, for example, that knowing that there are genes that can produce the disease, that just doing a genetic therapy would be a solution. But it happens that it's not that simple. It seems that the genetic uh, mutation is key to produce the disease, but it's not the only factor. So we have, for example, animal models in which we have been able to produce the same mutation in the gene. And just by doing that, in the animal models, they don't develop moya moya, which means that there should be other factors, other environmental factors that we still need to investigate to explain how that happens. So we don't have a new treatments for moya moya. We have good treatments that have been established over time, but usually invasive and kind of to fix what is wrong already. Uh, and we need to investigate more to try to address the disease itself. For the diagnosis of moya moya, probably have been a significant amount of advancement. In the past, we used to do a lot of angiographies, catheter angiographies that most likely many of you had, going, puncturing the artery, going inside, doing the angiogram, and it still is a very commonly used technique to diagnose the disease. But the imaging that we have available these days have improved a lot. We have MRIs that allows us actually to see the walls, vessels, and that can be very useful to try to distinguish between the different forms of moya moya. And we have studies that have uh, the ability to measure the amount of blood that goes to the brain. And even though those things are difficult to 100% validate, they have provided very useful information. So we get to understand not only the morphology of the disease, and by that what it means is that the arteries look bad in an angiogram, but what is the impact of those arteries looking bad in the function by being able to measure the amount of blood flow that somebody may have and determine certain needs that patients may have based on the cerebral blood flow and the time of perfusion that they may have. So, 
Yes. So, sorry, I just kind of wanted to ask a question based on like kind of what you said in the beginning. Do you feel like even after we have had a surgery either on one side or both that we are ever cured? Like, would you ever call someone with Moya Moya cured? No, unfortunately not, because the changes that are produced in the vessel itself, the narrowing of the carotids or the branches of the carotid, don't go away. So the surgery is, is palliates and provides a solution to the flow issue, but it doesn't correct the process that happened in the arteries itself. So there is no cure uh, if, by doing surgery. Hopefully someday we will get to understand the disease to the point that we could even reverse it. But that is not in the short term. Could the arteries that you've taken to bypass develop the disease as well? That is a, a very good question. And the good news is no, they don't. So they don't, they, they don't develop the disease. In fact, they only, they, they, only the arteries of the brain develop this disease, which is very peculiar. It's only the carotid terminus and to a lesser extent, the posterior circulation that may develop the disease. But the arteries that we use for bypasses are arteries for the skin that don't develop the disease. Right. Now, they may right. develop other kinds of diseases, like the ones that affect the circulation in the legs or the heart. And that's why many of you, your doctors, have been probably prescribing statins, medications to ensure that the cholesterol is good and they tell you to not to smoke because we want to keep those arteries flowing. But they don't develop more and more. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like a relief. <laughs> and yeah, I, I guess I kind of always want to, under the impression that it could spread into like the vessels they bypassed with. But you're saying, <laughs> only the brain vessels will get the moya moya disease. So yes. in the future, if you're bilat, like if you had the SDA MCA bypass, you could potentially end up with a posterior issue down the road from moya moya. Like, I mean, yes, I think that, that question has to do with the concept of progression of the disease. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about that because I think there are some uh, some questions regarding that. So we, you all have learned that Moya Moya is a progressive disease. That's the way we describe it. But let me put it in the real con context of what that means. What that means is that when we look at the natural history, patients that are not treated, a significant number of them have a progression of changes. For example, mm -hmm. patients that have disease in one side very often may develop disease in the other side. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the nature of the disease is consistently and universally progressive. So let me explain that. The best data that we have of the degree of progression of Moya Moya disease is that approximately 20% of patients that have Moya Moya disease will have progressive narrowing of the arteries of their brain or that they will have collateral involvement of the arteries of the brain and, and, and disease in the other side. That is important because it is not a, a sentence that your disease will go to a point where there is nothing that can be done. In fact, most of the patients reach some level of stability at some point. Unfortunately for some of them it happens when they already have a strokes but for many, the ones that have had the opportunity to have surgeries and that receive attention early on, they may not necessarily progress. And I have followed patients for longer than 20, 25 years, and many, many of the patients get to have the disease to a point where they present, and only two out of 10 have progression in the other side or have worsening of that side. And because the practical solution of bringing blood flow through the bypasses doesn't address the cell, the, the point of the disease that is the artery from itself. from that circle, Willis, yeah. Yes, because it's yeah. different, then it doesn't to get be affected by Moya Moya. Okay, that makes Very more sense. Very interesting. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. That was a great yeah, thank you, thank you. Thanks for elaborating. Um, and actually, uh, our next question was going to be from Shirley Hubbard asking about a cure. So uh, we've already covered that, but thank you, Shirley, for submitting that. Um, the next couple questions have to do more so with genetics. Um, these are from actually a couple different parents. 
um, that have Moya Moya, uh, including myself. Um, and the question is, what are the statistics regarding Moya Moya being passed on to a child of somebody that is diagnosed with Moya Moya? Are there any knowns or unknowns involving genetics? And then secondarily, are there any tests available to determine the likelihood of a child carrying the Moya Moya gene and what should parents, uh, parents that have Moya Moya be uh, looking for or be aware of? Yes. So that, that's a very interesting and it's a little bit of a complex question, but let's uh, try to address it in the most comprehensive way we can. We know that around 12% of patients with Moya Moya may have family members with Moya Moya. Now, that number needs to be taken with some grain of salt. Means doesn't mean that when we have a patient with Moya Moya, there is a chance of 12% of a relative having it. It is a, a different thing. It is that when we find patients with Moya Moya, 12% of them may have a family history. And that number is important because that was the, the number that uh, pushed us to try to do research on the genes of the disease. Now, the genetics of the disease have been extensively studied, but we still don't have enough data. What we know is, however, very valuable. We know that there is a mutation of a gene. It's called the ring finger or RNF213. That RNF213 gene is very common in patients that have Moya Moya. Now, that gene can have different variations. There is one variation of the mutation of the gene that is the R4810K that is very, very common in the Japanese and the Korean populations. So among them, we have identified very clearly that many patients with Moya Moya have an abnormality, have a mutation in that gene. It's kind of a special mutation that makes it most likely hyperwork. And that is important because this gene normally produces some proteins that seem to be related with the immune system. So our, our body has a protein that is produced by the RNF that normally help us to defend ourselves from diseases, from, from microbia. But when it is expressed abnormally, then it can produce or be uh, one of the factors to produce the Moya Moya disease. So we know that in the Japanese and Korean populations, when they have Moya Moya, it is actually important to check for their genetic uh, uh, possibility of a mutation in the RNF213. That is important because it helps us in two ways. It helps us to distinguish the Moya Moya disease from the Moya Moya syndrome, the other conditions that may be secondary. But also because it tells us a little bit about the risk of family members having the possibility of developing Moya Moya. So for Japanese and Korean populations, we know that when they have the RNF213 mutation, there are two chances. Let me explain you uh, that a little bit in detail. We all have in each of our genes two copies of that gene. We call that alleles. So uh, we receive one from our father and one from our mother. So each of our genes that determine each of the proteins that we build in our body is coded by two by a gene, and that gene has two copies. When the two copies have the mutation, we call that hetero homozygous, and when the copies are different, we call that heterozygous. And what we know is that in patients with Moya Moya disease that have the homozygous, meaning that they have the, in the two alleles the mutation of the RNF213, the chances of passing the disease to family members is around 78%. That's very high. Now, what we know also is that when it's a homozygous, which is the most common way, when it's only one of the alleles, the patients may have the disease. And surprisingly, the chance of them passing the disease to their kids is less than 1%. Now, that research has been possible because of the coherence and consistent way in which samples have been collected and analyzed in those countries, in Japan and in Korea. When we talk about the other populations, those of us that are non-Eastern Asians, the things become really complicated. 
We know that the RNF213 mutation is also common, but we don't know exactly what the predictive value it has. We don't know exactly which variants may be there. So in the Western population, it has not become traditional that we check for the genetic background. I still, however, do it because in my mind, if I have a patient and it is not clear if there is some risk factors or not, it may help me to think about the possibility of having the mutation of the RNF213 that most likely what that patient has is Moya Moya, not a secondary form of Moya Moya, but Moya Moya disease. It also, I think, helps because once if we have a family history that is clear that there is members of the family that may have had that history, then we could identify that gene. It doesn't mean that doesn't appear in Western populations, is that is less common. But by doing that, we could also potentially assume that if somebody has a homozygous alleles, then that they have a higher risk of passing it to the family. So kind of to summarize, the genetics play a very important role in Moya Moya disease. We have been able to identify the gene, the RNF213. We know details of the gene for the Japanese and Korean population. This is actually different for the Chinese. We know that for them, there is a significant risk of passing the disease if they are homozygous, if both alleles are mutated. The same principle could apply to our patients if we find that the gene is abnormal. The only thing is that most likely we're not going to find the same variation because the variability in the Western population is broader. I am an advocate that we should create banks and that we should work cooperatively to try to understand better the disease in the more diverse population of the United States. So we could get to conclusions similar to the ones that the Japanese and the Koreans have been able to elaborate, uh, but we don't have enough data to do that. One of the good things of, of talking with you guys is, is, is to ask for that, because let me be very honest, you have a, or you have a member or you, you have yourself a rare disease. So everybody kind of wants something from you to, to help in the research. And that is very important uh, and sometimes maybe become exhausting. But at the same time, if we don't work together, it's the only way uh, we, we can uh, kind of identify these things. So it is essential that in the United States, we develop really large cohorts of cooperation between different doctors, institutions, but essentially between patients to be able to discover these uh, factors that may help us to define the risk for members of our family or even possible treatments. I hope that answers the question. I hope I didn't go too much into the branches. No, I, it's uh, taking me back to high school biology class, but in a good way. <laughs> uh, I, I personally uh, find it, you know, very fascinating and honestly encouraging of what we do know. Um, having a four-year-old daughter, of course, um, the minute I became pregnant, um, my husband and I was, you know, just something on our mind. So um, it is interesting to know what we do know uh, and what we can work towards, you know, hopefully. And uh, maybe at the end of the call, you can uh, elaborate a little bit on how uh, willing patients can participate in anything to help. I know I, I have had so much uh, blood drawn, another few vials uh, to help the cause uh, would be uh, something easy for me. So anyway, we can talk about that at the end. We do have a few more questions. Some of them you've touched on already, uh, which is always nice. Um, again, Shirley Hubbard had asked about if you have Moya Moya on one side, will you automatically expect to get it on the other side of your brain? Um, again, a good question, of course, and I think you already touched on that. Um, uh, just, to, then, just to emphasize it, no, you may not. Uh, there is a chance, I say around 20%, to 30% chance that you will get in the other side, but doesn't necessarily mean that you are sentenced to have it. It's not a, it's not a, a fit, it's not um, expected 100%. So that's good for those that are unilateral. Um, another question that Sarah brought up, and I've heard this come up in my own, um, you know, support groups. How common is anxiety after being diagnosed or treated for Moya Moya? Um, again, I've heard, and that Sarah mentions that um, we hear a lot of stories about. Uh, anxiety, panic attacks, different things coming up. 
after treatment, after diagnosis. Is that something that you hear a lot about? I know that your realm is in surgery, but do you uh, hear of that as something that's common? Yes, it is. Yeah, almost 40% of the patients with Moya Moya may develop some form of uh, psychiatric issues, and the most common is depression and anxiety. Uh, there's a very small population of patients that may develop actually psychiatric symptoms, like uh, psychotic symptoms, as the only manifestation of moya moya. But that is very rare. So it, it is clear that there is a correlation between moya moya disease and uh, psychiatric and emotional disorders. Now, the case of the depression and the anxiety is very interesting because it may have two components. There may be components associated to the fact that the circulation of the blood flow to the brain that controls some of these emotions is impaired. But there are also some other components in which we need to help. And even though I, I'm a surgeon, I'm very aware of that. And it's very important that, that you are. Let me let me explain you. Uh, being diagnosed with moya moya that is so unknown, even for many physicians, is a big shock and is very traumatic. All of a sudden, symptoms that are weird and unexpected and, and that you really cannot correlate with many things become this disease that is rare, that is progressive, that can produce strokes, and which solution often have to do with surgeries and big interventions. That is very traumatic. That makes us wonder and ask about the future, how we're going to live, what we're going to do with my family. I'm going to be able to have a family or not if you're young enough or who is going to be taking care of me if something happened to me. That is normal, but it has actually some consequences for the disease because when we turn to let our emotions get the best of us, we have physiological reactions in which we start hyperventilating. So we respond to stress by breathing fast. And when we breathe fast, several things happen. One of the things that happen is that in the arteries of our brain narrow. So for patients that have more moya, anxiety is a serious issue because the anxiety may trigger a narrowing of the arteries of the brain that then may trigger actual more symptoms of moya moya. And that is something that we can help to control. We can help to control first by being realistic about the impact of the disease. Yes, it is a rare disease. Yes, can produce strokes. But at the same time, we have, as without enough knowledge of how the disease is, we have solutions. We bring blood, we kind of bypass the problem and try to bring more blood. That is one thing. The second thing is that the patient needs to be self-aware of the symptoms too. Because when you feel, and it's common that you may feel some tingling, some numbness, even after surgeries, if you feel those symptoms, doesn't necessarily mean that something horrendous uh, and devastating is going to happen. It may be that your level of hydration was not good, that your blood pressure may be running a little bit low. And being able to control the anxiety that that produces is important because by controlling your breathing, you can actually prevent the narrowing of the arteries to be worsened by the hyperventilation. Also, it's important to work together. And one of the essential missions of groups like this is that, is to recognize that as rare as it is, you're not alone, that this affects other people. And these other people also have gone through the same, but they have families, they're working, they are, they are doing their lives, so can you. You cannot let this overwhelm you. And I'm going to give you a point of view that is personal, and I think it's good for many diseases, not only moya moya, but, but hear me out. I, I, I think it may be useful. Uh, there is a poet, Rumi, uh, that says that wounds are the places where the light enters our bodies. And when we when we face disease or problems or losses, when we lose people that we love, or we we feel we feel wounded, and it's painful. And being diagnosed with moya moya produces that. It wounds us. It makes us being feeling that we are fallible, 
that someday we may lose our function or our life. And that is something that we don't like. But that doesn't mean that that makes us weak. It's actually the opposite. That entering of the light on your lives is something that is really very valuable. You have a different perspective of life that many other people don't have. You know the value of little things. And that one is essential. That value is somebody is something that nobody can take you. And uh, that value makes you, in a way, a more mature person. Somebody who can handle difficulties in a different way a better parent, a better sister, a better father, a better colleague, a better worker. Because, because most of us go through our lives without realizing that our life is a beautiful gift and we don't enjoy it and, and act on it as we should. We cling in silly things and, and, and get upset with the stupid little things. So, this question of the anxiety is very important because if you realize that the anxiety, what is producing you is it, it, what, the, what is producing that anxiety is the fear. And then you start controlling that fear. You are actually conquering one of the major fears of all humans. There is the fear of getting sick, getting old and dying. And that conquering is not because we were not going to get old or we're not going to get sick or someday we're not going to die. No, we conquer it because we remove power from that and we do what we have to do with our families, with our colleagues, with our works. So the psychiatric aspects of Moya Moya are very important, but they're not just a matter of prescribing a medication or getting a diagnosis. It's a matter also of us growing on them or not letting them control them as much as possible. And some of us may need medications to help us on that, to switch that depression, to help us see the things in a more broad perspective. Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> I see in the chat, I'm not the only one um, that's teared up. Um, just I, I'll echo other sentiments that just so beautifully said, and I think all of us, you know, uh, patients and, and the few I know that are on here that um, have uh, children with, with the Moya Moya, you know, it is, it, it's devastating. It's a shock. Um, I, you know, we all remember, you know, hearing the words and wondering what Moya Moya even is. And so um, I know some folks that registered that had only been diagnosed a couple weeks ago. And then there are those of us that have been um, 10, 16, 20 years. Uh, we all feel the same way though. We all feel, um, I think, isolated and alone in the diagnosis, but when we are able to find others uh, and groups and information, uh, it does help uh, tremendously in my experience and from what I've heard from others. And um, it, it, it eases the, the, the feelings of loneliness and concern when you know others have memory issues, others have weird TIAs that just pop up and we don't know what that means. Is that horrible? And that means I'm gonna be in the hospital. No, not necessarily. And um, I think it is uh, just so valuable to be reminded of how important it is to, um, to, to see these opportunities as, as areas of growth. I always say that I'm not thankful for Moya Moya. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I'm extremely thankful for what it's taught me and what it's brought to my life and for the people that it's brought into my life. Um, so thank you for elaborating on that and making all of us actually just feel a little bit better. I'll go ahead and say it makes me feel better too. And even knowing that others wanted to ask this question, you touch on a few other things. Uh, Carol Ann from Torrance, she had asked about, you know, what, what kind of complications, what things can we expect um, with this disease being progressive? And I think, again, you, you touched on that um, already, so thank you. Um, another question she asked, and I, I have the same question myself, how often should we be getting angiograms and or MRIs? Is there a frequency or routine that is recommended, uh, or is it solely based on, on issues, symptoms, complications? Um, can you uh, chat about that? 
Yes, even though the progression rate is 20%, but that is significant, which means that in many cases, no new things will be different in the scans that we get. I believe that it's important to keep an eye on them because we don't want to find out that the disease has progressed, let's say, in the other side, uh, just because we are having new symptoms. So in that respect, uh, my recommendation, there is no uniform recommendation, is to do images at least annually, even after you have the surgery. The, the reason to do the images is also because it allows us to see if there are some tiny little strokes that we may not be noticing clinically. Uh, and it gives us the opportunity to optimize other medical things that we may need to do to prevent strokes from happening. I am not a big fan, even though I do the angiograms, uh, and, and it's one of the important parts of my, my work, but I'm not a big fan of doing catheter angiograms for follow-up in patients with moya moya. I believe that one, uh, around six months or so after the surgery is reasonable, but after that, we have methods of imaging that don't expose you to any risk of a stroke, like MRIs or that, that are sufficient to provide information regarding the vessels. If something has changed that is significant in a vessel that will prompt us to do surgeries, let's say, in the other side, we should be able to see that in a regular MR angiogram with the resolution that we obtain from those studies. And my, my rationale is just that even a catheter angiogram, as safe as it is, it has a little risk of a stroke. Every time that you guys sign out for one of those, you knew that there was a risk of around one in every 200, 300 of having a stroke. So my, my policy is avoid it. Don't, I don't put my patients on that uh, unless I have in the MRI something that makes me concerned that there may be a progression, a new symptom, a new stroke, or a new narrowing or worsening of the narrowing. So, um, again, I have to disclose that's my personal approach, and your physicians may have different approaches, but the general idea is it's a good idea to look. Uh, in my opinion, the best way to look is every year with MRIs that are not invasive, uh, that produce images of your vessels and allows us also to see if there is some silent strokes that we may not have found clinically. Wonderful. That's great information. Thank you. Um, we're going to, uh, I see there's there's a question in the chat. Um, well, I think I saw it a little bit earlier from Layla. Um, but because we had some folks that did submit some questions, they are a little more individualized. But um, Carrie Mast from Callahan, Colorado, asked if there's a chance that a serious uh, trauma, physical trauma, could cause moya moya. She explained that she had suffered a br brutal cow attack on her farm in 2020 and then was diagnosed with moya moya just three years later in 2023. Could that attack have caused her moya moya? Like you had mentioned before, there are some things that can eventually you know, lead to it, in your opinion. Yes, uh, and, and that actually aspect of trauma has been studied by, by the Japanese because at the very, very beginning, uh, it wasn't clear if trauma could be a reason of Moya Moya or the secondary form of Moya Moya syndrome. The best evidence that we have uh, indicates that trauma is not related to the development of Moya Moya syndrome. Uh, for that reason, we have kind of removed trauma out of the list that in the 90s and 80s we have of possible primary causes. So these days we don't think it is. Most likely it ends up being a coincidence that, that we may have the disease brewing and going underneath and then you have some event like that happening. So uh, trauma generally is not considered an associated condition to moya moya. Thank you. That's very, it's all very interesting. Uh, we had another question from Hugo, uh, I hope I'm saying his last name, uh, Rousset. He is, uh, and I see that he joined us. He's from, um, again, uh, Annecy uh, in France. So we're excited to have some international presence here. Uh, he uh, mentions that he has seen and read that some patients get both direct and indirect bypass surgery. Uh, his wife, I believe, has been diagnosed with Moya Moya, and so he's wondering, for a woman in her 40s, is both recommended? or just direct bypass enough? Are you able to comment on that, generally? 
Sure. Uh, there, there is no proof that one technique is better than other in providing collateral circulation for the patients with moya moya. Uh, each one has certain advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the main concern with direct bypasses is that for a few minutes you need to stop the flow in the recipient vessel, uh, so that can cause a little bit of a stroke risk, uh, but in good hands that is usually very low. Uh, the main concern with the uh, EDAS or indirect bypasses is that it may not work right away. It may take a few weeks to form the vessels, so during a period of time you may not be uh, protected. Uh, and trying to resolve that, some people have been doing both, but then uh, in, in a way it may add a little bit of the risk of the clamping of the artery. The best thing is to discuss with your physician, because the doctors that do these interventions, like me, we all have our preferred ways, and we may select individual cases for individual uh, circumstances. So just the fact that there is a combined bypass doesn't make it more powerful than a direct or an indirect. Uh, discuss with the doctor the rationale that they may have. If the rationale is to bring blood right away, a direct bypass may suffice. In fact, every direct bypass kind of produces a little bit of an indirect bypass. If the concern is to try to reduce the risk, maybe an indirect bypass is a best option. So that one needs to be a personalized individual discussion with the physician. But to answer your question, there is not necessarily an advantage of one or another. Wonderful, thank you. And again, in the chat, we have Layla that asked, can you discuss Moya Moya patients that have occlusion issues of the bacillar artery and how the brain vessels work to combat that diagnosis? Yes. So when somebody has involvement of the posterior circulation or the vascular artery, it's very important to try to find out if there is only any other possible causes because it is rare in Moya Moya disease but more common in other circumstances, like for example, intracranial lateral sclerosis or some forms of vasculitis. If what you have, uh, it is Moya Moya disease, and if what there is, is Moya Moya disease that has now progressed to involve the posterior circulation, there is higher risks of a stroke. The best data that we have is that the bypasses still reduce the risk of having strokes, but they tend to be less effective in patients with posterior circulation involvement of the Moya Moya. Uh, again, the good news is most of the cases of Moya Moya disease itself don't have posterior invo uh, circulation involvement. When they do, the prognosis is not that good. Now, if it is one of the secondary reasons to have Moya Moya, we have improved a lot in several of the medications that can be used to reduce the cholesterol, to reduce, to make the blood thinner, uh, to control the blood pressure, to avoid the progression of the involvement of other vessels, like in circumstances of patients with intracranial lateral sclerosis. Thank you. And uh, Caroline uh, asked in the chat, how are parents able to get a genetic test? You had talked about, you know, with having the two homo alleles, um, are parents able to get a genetic test to see Is if it yeah, it depends of many factors, including the insurance and the physician that is providing care for you. Those things sometimes are limitants. Uh, the, the way we, we do it uh, here is that when I see a patient that is of Japanese or Korean uh, family or any patient from any ethnicity that has a family history of strokes, I actually write very strong support letters to have the patient itself getting genetic tested. If the patient itself doesn't have the RNF213 mutation, then there is no justification to do it for the kids. If the patient has the RNF213 mutation, then it's easy to convince the insurances that the kid needs to be not only tested, but also imaging, that we need to do an MRI of the brain to see if there is any abnormality in their vessels. Uh, it's a little bit of a battle, uh, and you have to get an advocate that will battle it with you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that when, when the case is in those circumstances. Either the ethnicity and race corresponds to high risk, or there are family members with history of high moya moya, and then we test the patient. If the patient has the mutation, then now we have a very strong argument to convince the insurers to pay for the imaging, the MRI for the pediatric patients or the kids, even if they're not pediatric, and uh, to do the genetic testing for them as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have one question that came in on email, um, and I actually, I this is something I always try to talk about. Um, 
it, it's, we all know the importance of staying hydrated. I, I, I think that's one of the things we're taught right away. But can you talk about um, the benefits of uh, staying hydrated with uh, liquids that have natural electrolytes? I remember you teaching me about that years ago um, as I was uh, newly diagnosed. Yes. So we, our bodies are like a little sponge. And within the sponge, we have the vessels that transport fluids. Now, when we drink water, the water kind of diffuses equally uh, among all the tissues. So some of that water kind of gets into the soft tissues, and only one third of whatever we drink of water stays inside of an artery or a vein. In patients that have moya moya, what we want is the water to stay inside of the arteries or the veins so they can transport the cells and bring oxygen to the brain. To do that, the trick that we have is that we tell you to drink fluids with electrolytes because then those fluids with the electrolytes get to be absorbed and they stay a little bit more inside of the vessels instead of just diffusing into other tissues, helping then to improve the circulation of the brain. Uh, sometimes things like sugar can help with that, but it's not good to exaggerate in the sugar because you don't want to have the side effects of diabetes and problems with hyperglycemia. So the electrolytes have that important trick. Also, be aware that you may lose more fluids than you realize. Hot days, exercise days, stressful days, flying in an airplane, all those things dehydrate you. And you need to be aware and catch up with more fluids than you would do in a regular day. Wonderful, thank you. I, I, I still remember uh, picking up a taste for uh, mineral water after you told me that. I didn't care for it then, but I enjoy it now. Unsweetened coconut water is another one I, I enjoy. I know it has natural electrolyte, electrolytes with not too much sugar. But um, yeah, that when that came in, I, I smiled because I remember you teaching me that uh, many years ago. Um, we're, we're right at the hour, but I did want to get to one more if we can here. Um, Lisa uh, asked a couple of the follow-up questions here. Uh, I do have a few questions. I did have bilateral, direct, and indirect bypass. I felt awful before and thought this was why I felt so bad. I don't feel any different besides not having strokes daily. Is that unusual to not really make you feel better? She goes on to say that she works in, a, in surgery as a surgical technologist. And she's right next to the C arm X-ray machine on a daily basis. Is that bad for her? That uh, sounds like she's got kind of two questions there. Yes. So the, the main goal of the surgery is, is to protect you from having strokes. Especially at the beginning, you may feel still some of the TIA symptoms. They usually tend to be shorter and shorter until they most likely go away, but it doesn't do it right away. You may not feel necessarily great or better. In few cases, patients feel like a cloud has been lifted out of their mind, but it's not the general case that that occurs. The exposure to radiation is one of the risk factors to develop secondary moya moya. You should be sure that if you are a radiology tech, you use a, a dosimeter to be sure that you're not exposed in excess uh, and that you use any possible preventing measures, distance, shields, all the things to prevent you from being exposed to radiation. Uh, and myself do so I'm a surgical so I'm tech. Of that. So I'm like I wear in my monitor, but I'm surgical surgical tech. So I'm like right next to the X ray and I'm in a lot of ortho cases. So and I've kind of wondered that before because I have to get monitored all the time. Am I gonna meet my number to where I can get my brain scan? Yes, so because of that, try to be very astute with this. First, try to, there is no reason why you cannot step out or far away from the C-arm when they are yeah. doing the X-rays. So don't allow yeah. anybody to radiate you <laughs> gratuitously. That shouldn't okay. be happening. The okay. second thing is you can use, uh, if you are in the same room, be sure that you are behind the barriers the shields that they have. The shields, okay. Yes, and be always very, very cognizant of that dosimeter to be sure that you don't exceed any of the doses that are the limit that are accepted. Usually, the form of radiation that produces moya moya is more when it's used for treatment, like patients that get really large doses of radiation for tumors, then they may they develop the moya moya. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, that's helpful. 
one. And I hope you feel better that that is little by little. And uh, you, again, there's many factors. Some people, uh, as long as you're not having a strokes, that is kind of really, really, really the ultimate goal of all these. Right. This is my two year today, my two year anniversary from my right side. And I'm three years out from like my original strokes, but I had seven of them and they were all on my left frontal lobe. So I feel like I'm having a lot of behavioral like depression, a lot of that going on. Yes. So, so pay attention to that. Address it with your doctor because yeah. you may need a little bit of help to, to help you move from that. Yep. Yep. And I am. I'm working with them. So Good. thank you. Wonderful questions. Happy surge anniversary. Um, I think thank you, you know, uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. We're five minutes after that. So it was a full 60 minutes here that we had. Um, uh, April, I know you asked a question, but uh, he did address that a little bit as far as of narrow uh, vessels can narrow again after surgery. Um, and so I'll encourage you to watch the recording if you had to join late. Um, again, we will have this recorded and transcribed. Uh, those that registered, uh, your email address will be used to send you a link to the recording. And um, soon, probably within the next month or so, we'll have it up on the um, World Moya Moya Alliance webpage, which is moyamoya.org. Um, we will also, we have a wealth of information there as well. And if you have other questions, if I may be bold to uh, ask doctor if they submit other questions, um, if maybe you can answer them just an email possibly. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll gather a couple of those. Uh, and you may receive a very short post-event survey. Um, we just want to know what you felt about this. Um, and more importantly, if you would be willing to join something like this again in the future. Um, so we hope so. We hope you found this beneficial. Thank you so much to, to Dr. Gonzalez, to Cedar sinai uh, and uh, especially to everyone that joined and participated. And um, we hope, again, we hope this information helped. I know I, I feel uh, better for it just as my own, uh, as a patient. So thank you again. Dr. It was Zane. really an honor to see you all and to answer some of your questions and uh, keep on going. This is this is just life and, and, and you are wonderful warriors. We are. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time, your wealth of knowledge and the support. It's been wonderful. Yes. An hour very well spent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. I'll stay on a second, Doctor, if you want. Yes. And Tara, meet meet Dr. Gonzalez. Tara's the, the president of uh, the World Moy Moy Association or Alliance. <laughs> uh, and uh, she is, am I correct in saying 20 years uh, post? Yes. Uh, Diagnosis and surgeries at Stanford. She knows uh, Steinberg very well and his team. Yes. Um, so she's. I'm 20 she's, years. Yeah, this June was 20 years um, since my diagnosis and surgeries, and I had bilateral strokes as an infant during the 1980s. Wow. I wasn't diagnosed until 2004. So wasn't yes. properly diagnosed until 2004. So um, this was a truly wonderful hour with you. I look forward to meeting you officially in person, um, hopefully sooner than later. Jen um, has raved um, about you and I can see why this was so wonderful um, and we're very appreciative. It has been my honor to be here really. And if there is any opportunity that we can do to follow up, to, to make it actually uh, maybe even a continuous mature conversation in which we get and address new issues because there are so many that that yeah. I will be happy to help in any possible way. Uh, Jen, I am very grateful for this. Uh, thank you very much. I have to go now, but but I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to yeah. being in touch. Let me know if they like it. I hope I hope I will. We did I will. A good job. I'll be in touch on email with you and, and Kat uh, for uh, follow up and everything. But thank you again, Doctor. This was wonderful. Have a great rest of your day and week. And we'll talk soon. All right. Take thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Bye.